In the previous module, we have seen what is meant by an energy policy. We have also seen a framework to analyze energy policies uh, and we uh, looked at uh, the air quality in Delhi and the INDC India's commitment in Paris and tried to analyze uh, how we can analyze these policies and how they are being implemented. We are continuing with this and we would like to like, take a look at some examples of energy policies. Let us look at access. And uh, as you know, for every country and especially for developing countries, the issue of access is one of the important energy goals. And that means we would like to provide affordable access to clean energy to the entire population. And in uh, terms of this, in the Indian context, we want to have clean cooking fuels. The Predominantly, the largest chunk of our uh, population still uses um, solid fuels, biomass, agricultural residues, typically in chulas with very low efficiencies and with adverse uh, environmental impacts in terms of local indoor air pollution which causes an impact in terms of respiratory diseases. So the idea is can we switch uh, from this solid fuels to more convenient fuels uh, like LPG, electricity, can we convert them to uh, modern biofuels, can we look at solar cooking and then the question of electrification and uh, we have had very significant uh, progress in terms of connecting almost the entire, uh, the entire country is now connected to uh, electricity but several households do not have uh, connection because of a uh, whole host of issues. Uh, related to income affordability. So, rural electrification is another issue. So, when you look at this, we can see that, you know, with increasing prosperity, the pro process of progress is where we started with initially just using human power, then going to animal power, and then initial going to renewable and natural power with wind and uh, 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 water and then we created basically everything started going into the fossil fuel where you can transfer and you had this centralized grid and you had fuels, uh, coal, oil, natural gas and going towards electricity. So even when we think in terms of cooking also we start there is this energy ladder where we go from solid fuels uh, to gaseous fuels and electricity and with income one actually moves towards using uh, more convenient and cleaner fuels. Um, what is the definition of energy access? Energy access is a household having reliable and affordable access to both clean cooking facilities and to electricity, which is enough to supply a basic bundle of energy services initially. And the idea is that this basic bundle or the level should keep increasing and then an increasing level of electricity over time to reach the regional average. So that means the idea is this is the definition by IEA part of the World Energy Outlook 2017 special report on access. The idea is that everyone should have access to clean cooking and uh, electricity and to meet their basic needs and over time this should keep increasing to go towards the regional average, local or regional average. And if you look at this, over the different income classes, when we look at, you know, the quintiles, quintile means uh, divide 100 into 5, uh, 20 percentiles, that means lowest 20 percent, then next and then and so on. So we can do that in terms of rural and urban. You can see basically the difference in terms of this. Uh, where you will find that in the context of um, uh, electricity, the lowest quantile has a smaller percentage of where they are using uh, electricity. Uh, as the higher income, this goes to about 79 percent. In the urban, it is almost like 100 percent and so on. So, the fuel mix is very dependent on the income and the lower income um, 
um, households are using uh, biomass, traditional biomass and maybe kerosene for the uh, lighting. And uh, so there have been a number of different policies and schemes. Uh, so in India, the, at the uh, for households which are below the poverty line, uh, an electricity connection is in many states provided free of cost and, and uh, this is being given for particular, in uh, many cases there is a Bhagya Jyoti and the Kutir Jyoti scheme, uh, wiring, meter, one connection, there is a limit in terms of the con uh, connected load to be provided, but this is almost given sort of free of cost and even the connection cost. So Bhagya Jyoti scheme and now there is the Pradhan Mantri Hargar Sahaj Yojana. In many of these cases there is an incentive for the initial con upfront connection cost and then there is a subsidized electricity use. Uh, however, still the uptake of these, some of these, there are uh, issues related to that. Uh, we can look at now, if you look at the cooking, you can see this is from a paper by Ravindranath and Ramakrishna where you see what happens, what is the implication of looking at uh, different kinds of uh, efficiency, low efficiency of the stove and the emissions, the health hazard, respiratory diseases, it also results in global warming and then there is uh, the, also it can have more time taken for collection and there is a stress on the biomass resource, there is a drudgery and, uh, and then also can result in poor uh, soil quality. There are, there are many different kinds of impacts. Uh, there are different kinds of chula designs and uh, it is possible. So this is a conventional kind of chula if you see, using a solid fuel. Uh, there have been improved chula designs which can be smokeless, which can improve the efficiency and some of these designs are also available uh, in the public domain where anyone can actually m manufacture them. They are, the initial capital cost is slightly, is higher but then uh, there is an advantage in terms of the efficiency and the health impact. And uh, of course, as we go up this stream, we are looking at uh, kerosene and LPG with uh, a much higher uh, um, uh, rate at which we are providing the energy or the power. Uh, the efficiencies are high and there is much better controllability in terms of turning up and turn down. And this is a sort of kerosene, pressurized kerosene stove and this is an air fryer, an electric air fryer. So, uh, and many of these are in terms of convenience, in terms of efficiency, in terms of emissions, they are much better. Uh, but some of these chulas which have been developed uh, have been the estimate uh, for this low, low smoke chula uh, of the costs have been there and you can see that we are talking in terms of a uh, couple of thousand rupees and one can think in terms of how to cost this. Uh, in general, the, the access of electricity and is linked very clearly with poverty and this is from the global energy assessment. You can see many of the Latin American and African countries with high poverty levels also have less electricity access. We have been relatively uh, low to pick up but now we are going towards uh, nearing at least 100% in terms of the village connections and slowly going towards uh, uh, 70, 80 percent in terms of households. Um, the other issue which is there is that in many of these cases you will find that uh, the uh, quality of electricity uh, in terms of uh, number of hours of uh, shortages and the reliability is another index that we can see. Now, there are, apart from the centralized grid, there are options where we can have uh, essentially uh, different kinds of uh, microgrids and we can create a license or a f licensee or a franchisee, uh, we can have a parallel license, we can have an off-grid collective and there are a, a different kinds of uh, business models for this. Uh, we have had in under these programs uh, the uh, v rural village electrification program, village energy security program. Uh, the recently DDG, which was earlier the RGGVY, and uh, we have 
essentially provided capital subsidy for many of these villages which are remote uh, and uh, some of these actually provide uh, almost 90 percent of the total project costs as a subsidy. Uh, the difficulty of course is that you have to have a mechanism so that subsequent maintenance, if you have a PV battery system, the battery payment and, and so on can be created. Again, there is even the national solar mission also, there is an off-grid component where we can look at this. Uh, you will be surprised to note that um, for low usage electricity, some of the uh, remote rural areas for uh, mobile charging, they pay a significant amount. It is a small amount of electricity that is required. But if you convert it into uh, per kilowatt hour, you will find that people actually end up paying quite a significant amount, uh, are willing to pay, um, but it is it's for a small amount of electricity. As we go up, go down, uh, increase the number of energy services, the first important one is cell phone charging, then comes lighting then comes entertainment in terms of TV and cable TV and then comes the other things in terms of comfort, fans and refrigerators and, and so on. And so you can create this kind of a service and demand curve. Um, there are different um, models and we have had a large number of um, distributed generating models. Some of them are not for profit, some of them are for profits and uh, there are different kinds of prices and mechanisms and if you are interested you can look at this in more detail. I am not going to cover this in this. And in many of these cases what happens is that there is local involvement in terms of operation and maintenance. Uh, for instance, in the Sundarbans there was a, the collective of the village energy and the uh, village community and they would actually train people. Uh, there was also a load limiters so that in case the uh, load went beyond a certain point and if that happened a number of times, uh, they would the household would be cut off. There was a fixed rate. In some cases, there are fixed rates. In some cases, they are metered. Uh, there are also, we are thinking in terms of uh, prepaid metering. And so there are a number of different kinds of things. And uh, as you can see, in terms of the measures which are there, the, many of these, uh, have been uh, encouraging demand side management or energy efficient operation uh, equipment because if we look, use energy efficient equipment then the requirement for the PV or the modules the rating decreases and then this becomes overall much more cost effective. So just to give you some ideas this is uh, for affordable access this is a small uh, um, uh, village in uh, Maharashtra there is a solar array, charge controller, battery and AC load and if you look at it, you can see that the most of the load is basically in the evening and with the result that the capacity factor would be low uh, and uh, this would result in uh, high average prices. So it is quite common when you look at uh, some of these, this is, these are three uh, biomass gasifier and PV, uh, the energy costs are of the order of uh, uh, 30 to 40 rupees per kilowatt hour. Of course, we have uh, worked out that if this is uh, designed efficiently, they could be lower, they are often oversized uh, and, and that is because the uh, demand estimation is not accurate. And, um, then I talked to you about the Sundarbans model where there is a cooperative for the renewable energy at different kinds of uh, in the Sagar Island. There are 17 microgrids, there is a West Bengal uh, 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 renewable energy development agency, there is a power plant operator, there are customers and there, there is a committee of the beneficiaries and this is how it sort of works. You can of course see when we look at cost of energy, if the load factors are low, the costs are going to be high and, and so on. So whenever we talk about these uh, microgrids or isolated grids, if they are uh, linked with only a residential load, load factors are going to be low. The way to do this is to add some industry or add some base load or to add telecom towers so that capacity factors increase and the average, uh, the costs of generation. We talked uh, in the ring, the financing, I talked to you about the Selco uh, example where they have providing uh, 
um, innovations in financing so that they can uh, look at solar home systems. Another company which has been doing this is Desi Power which has been aggregating uh, different kinds of uh, biomass based power solutions in Bihar and putting this in terms of the total amount of CO2 uh, savings and so getting the credit in terms of the certified emission reduction and then getting it registered under the clean development mechanism. They are also tied up with the telecom towers. The problem in many of these cases is that uh, when the grid has come to these locations, at some points these they have not been able to compete. Um, so they have also looked at uh, fixed uh, uh, costs in terms of irrigation pumps and households. And uh, husk power, a uh, similar again biomass based power, but they initially started with their own prize money and they looked at overhead pole wiring, they directly reached the end user. And if you see in terms of the usage of uh, for cooking, you look at uh, rural and urban households uh, over time and you can see that the mix of different kinds of fuels has changed over a period of time. Um, you can look at this from the NSSO data which is collected every few years, National Sample Survey and we have, uh, you can see for the income deciles, uh, this is plotted the energy consumption, uh, the end use energy and the total energy and uh, the interesting thing that you will find is that <laughs> the end use energy in the case of uh, urban, the total energy actually uh, initially declines and then increases. And this decline is because then uh, with the, uh, in the lower income classes, you are using more traditional uh, fuels and because of that, though the uh, end use energy is keeping on increasing, and because of the poor efficiencies, you can see this kind of a, a, a mix. This is from a paper in 2012. Uh, one can then make a comparison in terms of calculations. Now, uh, it is possible to have modern biomass based energy systems which will give you actually biomass gasifier based systems which give you LPG quality fuel and LPG. Uh, um, and control. So, for instance, if you look at this flame, this is a rice, this is based on a gasifier, but it is firing rice husk. And you can see that this flame is just like the LPG flame. And so, this is another thing which can be done. Uh, there are um, the stop designs, and this is uh, um, done by uh, the research group at ISC Bangalore. Um, this is the Urja stove. It needs um, pellets like this. Now what happens here is that this becomes more efficient, it improves the uh, emission, reduces the emissions better from a health impact, but then the feedstock, earlier biomass was just being collected and there was no price. Now this we have marketized uh, and we are now creating this as a market where they will have to buy these pellets and we need to have this change. So there is a cost implication of this. This is an innovation from the US, it is a biolite stove and the interesting thing about this stove is there is a thermoelectric generator, we are using the exhaust of the bio uh, of the stove and uh, this is used to generate uh, electricity, it can um, run a small fan which will cause the induced draft and it can also charge, uh, it can be connected to get an LED light or you can charge your cell phone. So this is an interesting uh, kind of innovation. Of course, uh, this will cost more than the normal stoves. There are different uh, kinds of biomass-based stoves made by some of the uh, technical NGOs in uh, Pune, and the compact biomass gasifier you can see. And uh, so, in all of these, we can think in terms of different kinds of uh, subsidy mechanisms. But when we talk in terms of cooking. It is needed for us to estimate when we think in terms of the environmental impact and the health impact. And uh, one parameter which is uh, used for this is the disability adjusted life years. 
So, one disability adjusted life year is thought of as one lost year of healthy life and the sum of these disability adjusted life years across the population or the burden of disease can be thought of as a measurement of the gap between current health status and an ideal health situation where the entire population lives to an advanced age free of disease and disability. This source is from the World Health Organization. You can see that this disability adjusted life year is the year of lost life and the, the year um, and the lost days of work. So what happens is because of disability, if people are not able to work at their full, their full uh, efficiency and they, are, they have to take leave. So that's one and then if people die at a, uh, at a year which is uh, before their expected uh, life tenure. And so these are computed again in terms of based on the emissions, the health impact, respiratory diseases and the number of deaths and then in that population statistically the age distribution uh, who, who are impacted, then for each one the number of years lost and then that's multiplied by the population. So this is something you can get more details both in the World Health Organization as well as several uh, papers which exist. But this is one way to quantify and uh, in doing this we can see how indoor air pollution compares with for instance outdoor uh, air pollution or uh, with actual uh, diseases and their impacts and you find that it is in most countries this is a very significant it comes in amongst the top few uh, in terms of the health impact. And this is something where we can see if we have a scheme where we can reduce the emissions then we can adjust this and, and compare. So there is this whole um, chain as we said emissions then the exposure and this depends on a variety of things that means what is the time activity profile, what is the ventilation of the stove and the home and what kind of fuel is there, location of the kitchen, gender, age and cooking habits, demographic variables and the cultural practices ethnicity, income and education, fuel type and stove type, uh, uh, the energy market structures, temperature variable. So there are a whole host of different parameters and many of these can be affected by policies. So now let's look at uh, uh, taking some of this uh, that we, uh, the earlier things that we have done and make a simple uh, calculation uh, to see what it means when we think in terms of uh, looking at the switch of fuels. So let's consider a poor uh, rural household that uses three kerosene lanterns with the following data. The cost of the lamp is 100 rupees, life is 5 years, annual ONM cost is given as rupees 20 per year, um, the usage is 4 hours per day or 20 milliliters of kerosene per hour, price of kerosene market price is given as 35 rupees per liter. We are given that the kerosene is 82 percent carbon by weight, specific gravity is 0.8. We want to replace it by so a solar PV lantern, capital cost is 550 rupees, life 10 years, 150 rupees, battery 2 years. Now the question that is asked is considering a household that uses kerosene, uh, calculate the annual cost and the CO2 emissions for each kerosene lantern and the viability of replacement with solar use a residential discount rate of 60 percent. So let's look at first um, household that uses kerosene, let's calculate the annual cost. Annual cost will be, annual first let's calculate annual kerosene used. <coughs> annual kerosene used is going to be, there are um, three uh, this is uh, sorry let's see for any each of the let's do this first for each one. Uh, each of these kerosene lanterns uh, is used for four hours okay uh, and in 
each hour it's using 20 milliliters. So, 4 into 20 by 1000 into 365 days. If you calculate this, you will get this as 29.2 liters of kerosene. So, that means um, for the household, if you are using 3 lanterns, 3 into 29.2 to 87.6 liters. And if we look at the cost, this will be 87.6 into 35, comes out to be rupees 3066. We have also said that there is a uh, operation maintenance cost of 20 rupees per lamp annually, 60. So, this comes to 3126 rupees, fairly high amount. <coughs> if we look at an annual CO2 emissions, Annual CO2 emissions, let us calculate annual CO2 emissions. Uh, this will be now we are using uh, 87.6 liters into density 0.8, that is about that is this turns out to be 70 kgs in each kg has 0.82 kg of carbon per kg of kerosene into C plus O2 giving you CO2, so 44 by 12 and this turns out to be 210 kg of CO2. Annual CO2 we have calculated. The next question was uh, so, uh, is it viable annual cost and the CO2 emissions? So, annual cost is 3126 rupees and the CO2 emissions is 210 uh, kgs. Uh, so, viability of replacement with solar. So, when we look at a replacement with solar, we are looking at a total cost is 700 rupees. Right, and uh, 700 rupees is saving us annually. Uh, we are saving uh, around 3,000 rupees. So the payback period is less than a month, uh, less than a year. And so from that point, it may be viable. Uh, however, uh, if we now look at it in terms of it, it seems to be viable. Let us look at it in terms of the annualized life cycle cost, annualized life cycle cost. If we look at the annualized life cycle cost of for one lamp, this is going to be 100 into capital recovery factor 0 0.6 and 5 plus 20 plus the 29.2 into 35. And if we look at this, you will find that you can calculate this as this turns out to be 0 0.663. This is 1108 rupees. What is the annualized life cycle cost for solar? This will be 550 into capital recovery factor 0 0.6 10 years plus 150 which is the battery and we said battery life is just 2 years. So, 0 0.6 and 2 plus we can add in both the cases that uh, the 20 rupees is going to be there. So, this is 550 into um, 0.6055 plus 150 into 0.985 and this turns out to be 632 rupees. If you add 20 rupees to this, 
which is the ONM, so it's 652 rupees. So obviously the ALCC seems to be lower, even if we forget about this cost, that means instead of 1100, I mean 60, the, the instead of 1100, it's like 1000 and 652. So from this point of view, at full cost of kerosene, this doesn't look to be viable. This looks to be viable. Solar looks to be viable. If we uh, compute, suppose there is a subsidy on kerosene, and this is 18 rupees per liter, then this will be 18 into 29.2. So now this is rupees 525.6. This now, in when it's subsidized, it is lower than the solar. So it will not be viable to shift to solar once you have subsidized kerosene. Uh, so the question now is calculate the cost of uh, lighting for each solar lamp. And if the model was to have a lease model, calculate the effective monthly payment. So for each solar lamp, if we look at it uh, in terms of um, the calculation that we had done, it was 652 divided by 12, which is 560 and 52, 448, something like 54 or 55 rupees per month. So that could be a, a, a way in which we could do this. This is of course with the high discount rate. If we calculated this with a societal discount rate of 10 percent, then this is going to be uh, much lower because we are going to do 550 CRF 0.110 plus 150 CRF 0.12. And with the result that this is just going to be, you can calculate this, you will find that this is 341 rupees. And uh, this is now point, I think this is uh, point 0.167 and this is 0.1627. This is point 0.576. So if 341 divided by 12 60 something like 25 26 rupees per month and uh, <clears throat> the advantage then is that uh, this company which has uh, uh, the government or a uh, public sector company which has a lower discount rate now needs to only recover at the rate of 25 rupees per month and uh, we can also look at if you see the subsidy that we had the subsidy per lamp was now 17 rupees into 29.2 so you'll see that we can also provide that subsidy uh, if we want to keep that subsidy constant we can even uh, reduce the um, uh, we can reduce the cap, um, uh, initial capital cost by that amount and uh, then we can have the, uh, we can redu uh, reduce the lease payment so that you know in instead in, in a month we are only paying uh, a lower uh, quantity. The advantage there now is that uh, because of the higher um, discount rate the household is not able to up, uh, um, upfront pay that initial amount and is now able to just pay these monthly payments. Um, so now the question then is the last part of the question is that would you recommend complete removal of the kerosene subsidy? And uh, when we think about this, the kerosene subsidy is also uh, to provide um, for kerosene is often used for cooking and uh, in some of these cases for instance if there is no uh, if there is a problem in terms of the battery and the solar uh, there would be an incentive for this 
uh, there will be uh, what will be the issues in implementation there is a transaction cost of actually providing this we need to provide uh, support for maintenance and what are the disadvantages of the solar lantern? We have to ensure that the PV uh, modules are kept in the sun uh, so that they get charged and then the usage pattern and the discharge. So there are, we would need to have a hybrid where we still can maintain a certain amount of kerosene and uh, this. But this gives you an idea of how we can look at policies and we can look at economic impacts of putting the subsidies. The kerosene subsidy is in, in, uh, incidentally being phased out, but in most cases where we can calculate, you can actually see that the solar subsidy, uh, replacing the kerosene subsidy by a solar subsidy makes a lot of sense.